Recently, I came across an Indiegogo campaign for a thermoelectric ice bath. Now, personally, I think an ice bath is an instrument of torture that you should avoid at all costs. But even if you do like ice baths, this is probably the worst way you can do it. And that's what I want to talk about in today's episode. So this thing is called the snow cap and it is an inflatable bath which has a sort of lid that goes on top of it which apparently contains the thermoelectric cooling mechanism uh, which according to those guys is capable of cooling the water down from 25 degrees celsius down to 2 degrees celsius which is nearly freezing uh, over a time span of about eight hours now, to get one of these, you have to pay, I think, about $1,200 over multiple payments, of course. And the campaign has collected about 350,000 euros, which is a substantial amount. Now, first of all, what do they mean by thermoelectric? Well, it refers to the use of thermoelectric devices, also known as Peltier elements, to get something called. So uh, this is what one of these devices looks like. It's basically a small module with a couple of wires uh, sticking out of it. I used to have a bunch of these laying around, but I couldn't find them for this video. So I don't have a real life prop to show you. You just have to do it with the image for now. Um, and so what this is, is when you apply a voltage to these two wires, uh, one of the sides of this device gets really cold and the other side will get really hot. So basically, it is a solid state heat pump, which is really nice because, you know, it's very small, it's lightweight, it's cheap, it has no moving parts, so it doesn't make any noise, it doesn't vibrate, there is no compressed gases involved or anything like that. So it seems like a really ideal cooling solution, and in some ways it is. If this thing is so great, then why isn't it used in every single refrigerator and air conditioning system on the planet? I mean, those tend to use bulky systems that involve compressors and gases that are not allowed to escape and all kinds of complicated stuff, and they make noise and they need maintenance. Why would they use such systems if thermoelectric devices exist? That has to do with efficiency. Uh, or more specifically in the world of uh, refrigeration equipment, coefficient of performance, or COP. So if you have a heat pump, uh, what you have is on one side you have heat being absorbed by the heat pump, that's the cold side of the heat pump, and then on the other side you have heat being dumped out again into the environment, which is the hot side of the heat pump. So if you have, let's say, a fridge, the cold side is inside the fridge and the hot side is usually located at the back of the fridge. You can feel that it gets warm. Or with an air conditioning system, you know, same story. The cold side is placed inside the building and the hot side, which dumps out the heat, is placed outside the building. And then also you've got energy going into the heat pump, which is the, the power that it consumes, right? The usually electricity, but it could be something else as well, depending on the type of heat pump. Doesn't matter for now. Now, the heat that comes out of the heat pump is the sum of the energy that got absorbed by the cold side and the energy that you put into it, right? Because the energy that you put into it ultimately turns into waste heat, and that waste heat also comes out along with all the other heat on this side. So the heat that comes out is the sum of these two. Now, the COP then, or coefficient of performance, is the amount of useful heat or useful cooling that it provides divided by or relative to the amount of energy that it consumes. So let's say that this is a fridge and it consumes 50 watts of electricity and it moves 100 watts of heat, right? So it, it absorbs 100 watts from the food and whatever is stored inside that fridge. Now that means you have 100 watts worth of useful cooling and you're using 50 watts of power, so your COP would be 2. Now what's interesting also is that the COP is always going to be better for heating than for cooling, because 
when you're using a heat pump to do heating, you can make use of the waste heat that it also generates. So let's say we have the same exact numbers. You know, we're still using 50 watts, we're pulling in 100 watts there. But this time we're not using it as a fridge, we're using it to heat something. Well now you have 100 watts plus 50 watts, you have 150 watts of useful heat coming out, which you're going to use. So now your COP would be 150 divided by 50, which is 3. So you actually have a better coefficient uh, of performance. So that is an extremely important number, right? It's arguably the most important number um, if you're going to build some kind of heat pump. And for a, a typical fridge or you know, air conditioning system, stuff like that, the COP tends to be between 2 and 4, depending on how good the device is and the conditions that it's operating in. So now what about the COP of a thermoelectric cooling system? Well, in order to uh, get a bit of a feel for that, let's take a look at a data sheet for a random Peltier element that I found on the internet. So in this data sheet are a couple of very useful graphs that we can use to analyze the performance of this device. So first of all, the graph at the bottom displays the relation between temperature difference between the warm and the cold side and cooling power. And the graph at the top displays the relationship between, again, temperature difference and the voltage that is being applied. The different colored lines, so the different lines in those plots, represent different amounts of electric current that we run through the module. So let's say that we were running this module at 0.8 amps of current, and we have a temperature difference between those two sides of 10 degrees. Now, if we look in the graph at the top, we can see that the voltage is going to be 3. So that means the electric power consumption is 3 volts times 0.8 amps is 2.4 watts. The graph at the bottom will tell us that 10 degrees of difference at 0.8 amps of current will result in 8 watts of cooling power. So the COP then is going to be 8 divided by 2.4 which is 3.3. Now, that's not bad. That's pretty good, actually. That's within the same range that a lot of fridges and air conditioning units operate in. So things are looking great for the thermoelectric device. Unfortunately, that was an extremely favorable example because in this case, we're running this module at very low power, so only 0.8 amps, which is a a fraction of what this module is rated for, and we're running it at only a very small temperature difference of only 10 degrees. If you were to do this for a more reasonable temperature difference to build something like a fridge, so let's say 20 degrees, you can see that our cooling power would drop to 4 watts, and our voltage would go up slightly, so the electric power consumption would also increase, which means our COP is going to be more like one and a half, significantly worse. On top of that, again, our useful cooling power has dropped to only 4 watts, and it was already quite small at 8 watts, but now it's half of that. So you're probably going to want to compensate by running a bit more current, but if you do that, your power consumption is also going to rise significantly, and your COP is probably going to decrease to 1, or maybe even less than 1. And on top of all this, 20 degrees is still an optimistically small temperature difference for something like a fridge, because you also have to factor in that the hot side of your Peltier elements is going to be significantly warmer than the ambient temperature. So even if you're putting a massive heatsink on these elements to keep them as cool as possible, potentially with a lot of fans blowing air through them as well, uh, the hot side of your Peltier elements is likely going to be at least 5, maybe even 10, 15 degrees above the ambient temperature. In which case, again, to get the right temperature on the cold side of the elements, your delta T is going to rise even further and things are starting to look really quite bad. So at this point, you might be thinking, okay, but you just picked out a poor example of a Peltier element. That's not the case. This is kind of the 
current state of Peltier elements. You find any other commercially available, uh, practically usable Peltier element that works in this temperature range, and you're going to find very similar, if not exactly the same numbers. Thermoelectric cooling systems at this temperature range and with these kinds of temperature differences are just not efficient. They have COPs, practically achievable COPs, that are generally less than one, if not significantly less than one. And so that will also be the case uh, in this ice bath. So unless these people have invented their own potentially Nobel Prize winning uh, thermoelectric material that's going to solve this problem and apparently have decided that the best way to use such a new material is to build an ice bath, they're going to have exactly the same struggles and uh, the COP of this thing is going to be absolutely awful, which means it's going to use loads of energy. So let's take a look at how much energy it would actually take. So according to the specs, this thing can contain up to about 300 liters, but let's say a person takes up about 80 liters of space in there as well. So say you need to cool down about 220 liters of water. Now using that volume, the heat capacity of water and the temperature drop that they are advertising, 25 down to two degrees, you can calculate that the amount of thermal energy that you need to extract or like remove from that water to get it down to that temperature is about six kilowatt hours. So you need to suck around six kilowatt hours of heat out of that water to get it to the right temperature. So a conventional, pretty basic, simple refrigeration device uh, which has, let's say, a COP of around two, will use about three kilowatt hours of electricity to get this job done. How much energy would it take with a thermoelectric device? Well, as we've just seen, their COP is typically significantly below one, but let's say it's around one, to you know, give them the best shot here, it's going to take around six kilowatt hours, if not more. And the thing is, on their website, they kind of admit this, or not their website, I think it's on the Indiegogo page, doesn't really matter. They say it takes about $1.10 to cool down this tub, which, assuming that they've used an average US electricity price of 15 cents per kilowatt hour, adds up to about 7 kilowatt hours of energy. So the marketing works quite well here, right? They're like, you know, only $1.10. And people will be looking at that and going, huh, that's like a fifth of a cup of coffee these days. <laughs> okay, yes, that's fair enough, right? But, you know, what these people don't realize is that with a different type of equipment, and the type of equipment that has existed for decades is called a fridge, uh, you could do the same thing for like 40 cents using at least twice as much energy as you would normally need. They've made a thing that uses way more energy than necessary. It's probably one of the most wasteful ways to make an ice bath. And I mean, why would you want an ice bath in the first place? Anyway, we're not worrying about that. So I think that's curious for a business that, according to their website, cares about being eco-friendly. Now here's something else that's interesting, and when you open that little tab that says eco-friendly, it claims to be eco-friendly because they're not using the toxic gases that are used in normal refrigeration equipment. Um, and I think that that is very interesting. It's interesting because it, um, well let me explain, right? A long time ago, when refrigeration was just this kind of new thing that was starting to get used, a lot of pretty nasty things would, would be used as refrigerants, right? So the gases that are compressed in, inside these systems. Things like ammonia, which is a pretty nasty, a toxic thing, uh, and propane, which is of course pretty flammable and therefore a fire hazard in some situations. And so what they wanted to do is they, they wanted to invent new refrigerants that would be much safer to deal with. So they came up with synthetic refrigerants, and this is stuff like Freon. And when those were first invented, it was, it was brilliant because these gases were so much safer to deal with. They, they were pretty much inert gases. They wouldn't catch fire. They wouldn't 
be toxic, at least not very much in smaller quantities. It was great, right? It was amazing and, and far safer to deal with than these old nasty substances that would be inside refrigeration loops before. However, as we've learned now, uh, these synthetic refrigerants also broke down the ozone layer and had global warming potentials something like 10,000 times as strong as CO2. So we made some new variants that had a bit less global warming potential and they no longer destroyed the ozone layer, which was good, but they were still quite bad in global warming potential. So nowadays the trend for like modern refrigeration equipment is actually to go back to these old school refrigerants like ammonia and propane these things are making a comeback because yes they might be more hazardous to deal with for the person installing the the system or, or whatever but they're also much more eco-friendly and, and not like a little bit no literally hundreds to thousands of times better for the environment uh, than synthetic refrigerants. So that's why it's kind of funny that they say, you know, it's eco-friendly because it doesn't use toxic gases, when ironically, uh, modern refrigeration equipment is starting to move back to toxic gases because those are actually better for the environment. But anyway, that was kind of a... Uh, a little bit of a tangent that doesn't really matter to the point of this video but what does matter is that ultimately a refrigeration loop is a closed sealed system right these gases regardless of what they are they're not meant to come out they only come out when something breaks down or someone's being very careless when filling it up for the first time or it's recycled improperly basically when something goes wrong and while this does happen, and it is a concern, a very legitimate one, especially for legacy refrigeration systems that still use old synthetic refrigerants and are leaking as we speak, that's not an excuse to start using a different method that uses like two or three times as much energy. That's ridiculous. Finally, it's important to mention that thermoelectric devices, you know, Peltier elements, definitely have a lot of useful applications where they are actually a really good choice. So, for instance, they are very popular in lab settings. So let's say you're in some kind of lab, you have something small that needs to be cooled down uh, with very accurate temperature control, and you don't want to have like mechanical noise and vibrations that can mess up the experiment. A Peltier module would be an excellent choice here, and efficiency is not that big of a concern, right? Because you're only trying to cool something very small, it's only like incidental anyway, so who cares that it uses a bit more energy than, than is required here. On the other hand, if you want to refrigerate big things over long periods of time with large temperature differences like an ice bath or a refrigerator at home or even an air conditioning system, well, then efficiency is very important, and that makes these devices an awful choice. Anyway, that's it for today's video. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you did, then um, consider clicking the like button or even subscribing. And uh, of course, thank you very much for watching.